Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to our Cost Control and Construction course. This is Lecture 4A, and in today's class, we're going to be looking at measuring construction progress to meet project goals and effectively replan the work. So we're going to be looking at a number of things. We're going to be taking a very sort of micro or granular uh, look at how um, schedules are updated and some of the requirements that we need to have so that we can measure how we're doing as the work progresses. In previous sessions, we've been talking about topics such as VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. We talked about the Pareto principle, the 2080 um, rule, 20% of our um, project success or Basically, 80% of our project success is going to come from 20% of our focus in some of the difficult activities, let's say. Um, but there's a lot of other ways that the Pareto Principle can also be used. We talked about the aspect of requiring focus and with all the distractions that we have in our current work environment, how we need to develop certain habits and principles and routines that will help us um, focus on something that's really important to being successful, which is really understanding how you're doing as your project moves along towards that line of uh, completion. And so today we'll be also, uh, as I said, looking at it from a granular point of view and also uh, looking at how we can measure uh, and view our project from a higher level. Uh, so we'll be sort of uh, bringing in several tools that uh, help us that way. So in lecture 4a, we'll be bringing in the direct method uh, that I've kind of developed. It's really sort of a six step process and a way of thinking about projects. And in the lecture 4b, we'll be sort of doing a very high level view because I think it's important not to get stuck in the weeds uh, to remember what our overall or overarching project goals are. But at the same time, we can't forget the weeds because if we forget the weeds, they kind of take over. Um, so we'll be looking at it both ways. So when we think about measuring construction progress, uh, a, an effective project management system needs to fall in line with these constraints slash goals that we've talked about earlier in the course. Particularly, we talked about um, the five constraints of cost, schedule, quality, scope, and we also had safety in there. For the purposes of cost control right now, I'm not going to include that there. Oh, I've actually got it down here. And risk. Risk was where we brought in the elements of VUCA. Um, so these are all areas that we need to consider in a project management uh, uh, system. And to be successful, we really needed to address these from very early on in the project cycle. Um, so really, um, for co cost control and specifically to be effective, um, we need to address uh, setting and recording a baseline, a cost baseline that we can measure against. And in the previous lectures, we started to look at uh, work breakdown structure and breaking something from a high level down into more levels of detail, coding it so that we can identify with it, and then being able to follow along on the details. And so really that requires being able to measure it in a timely fashion. We kind of talked about the difference between cost reporting and cost control. And cost control needs to be more timely uh, in measurement so that we can compare the baseline to what's actually going on in our project. And we have an adequate time that we can start to apply that knowledge in reiterating the project and that's really what happens right uh, the original plan usually doesn't um, stand all the way through we've got to iterate as we go along adjust pivot uh, be agile so that recovery aspect recovery of time recovery of money comes into play in a big way uh, so peter drucker famously said and peter drucker was a, a very um knowledgeable individual that really sort of um, wrote a lot on uh, management and was a professor uh, that really sort of studied uh, progressive management practices for probably over 60 years. And uh, he wrote, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, and really wrote the book uh, Management by Objectives or Goals. And so that brings back to what we talked about with SMART goals. And so with cost control, we've got to have it that we can measure it. If we can't measure how we're doing, 
Uh, we really don't know how we're doing. So we've got to be able to break things down that we can measure it. And in construction, that's all the more important because construction projects can be so large and at the same time, so granular and detailed. So we've got to make sure that we can actually um, measure it to see how we are actually doing. And as I mentioned, um, understanding that whatever plan that we have in place, is probably not going to measure the way that we plan. There's going to be some variances in that. And that's the term we use in managing this project is cost variances and schedule variances comes up. Uh, most software, that's how it refers to it. Uh, Microsoft Project being one example, Primavera being another one in construction. So there's a lot of factors that we need to consider. Also, the accuracy of the data. And it's important that the data is accurate. I gave an example in the previous lecture about uh, where um, costs were applied inappropriately to something else and it almost canceled the whole college program as a result of it because you're looking at data that wasn't factual. Uh, in that example, uh, people were assigned to a particular college program and that college program then looked like it was losing money when in fact another program looked like it was making lots of money. It gives you the incorrect information, it gives you incorrect signals and that's dangerous too if you start acting on incorrect information. Also in construction, if we're not really following the data, we might make certain assumptions. Oh, this is where we lost all the money. Maybe, but maybe not. Um, so you want to have some sort of method that's going to give you reasonable amount of accuracy. I don't mean that you have to be like within just a few dollars, but at least if you have a reasonable understanding of where the money is being made, where the money is being lost, what's pretty much on track for the way you planned it, that's helpful. That's really helpful. And is it usable? Like how often will we be collecting this information? You know, if we're collecting it every minute of the day, maybe we're not, we're so busy collecting information, we're not actually doing anything. Um, so it's got to be able to provide us with a return on our investment of time, collecting the data and analyzing the data and making sure that we have um, valid systems and processes in place that makes it easy or at least as easy as possible for us to do that. So, when we think about that, uh, we want to be able to have a series of best practices that will allow us to be able to um, meet or beat our budget and schedule out of the gate. We want to have those processes and systems in place. And best practices is something that occurs over a period of time with an organization, a construction organization. You know, you start out small as a construction organization, you start doing things and probably you don't have a lot of time for systems, you're just trying to get jobs done. And as the business grows, then you adopt systems because you need to adopt those systems in order to be successful. Uh, because you're growing the company, you're adding people to it, it's harder to manage those uh, people if you don't have systems in place that tracks what they're doing and holds accountabilities in place. Uh, so you don't want to get into a situation where you lose control of your projects and systems um, can definitely help you uh, and uh, ensure that you're able to repeat those systems in the future. Um, so I think of uh, uh, some books that I've read on uh, poker uh, really not about playing poker, they're really about making decisions. And poker is usually used as the vehicle to identify um, a process where things aren't 100%. And I've mentioned this before with my groups, uh, that things are not 100% sure. In construction, things are far from 100% sure when you make decisions. And you can make good decisions and have a bad result and you can make bad decisions and have a good result. But there's always probabilities in there. Generally, if you're making good decisions, the probability is very high that you're gonna have a good result. But sometimes eh, you're gonna have a bad result even though you made a good decision. Bad decisions, the probability is probably more likely that you're going to have a bad result. Um, but sometimes you do a bad result and you get lucky. Uh, that happens maybe more often than I'd like to think in construction. So we have a lot of people out there that are making continuous bad decisions until a catastrophic result occurs, which is never a good thing. Um, so it's good to understand that from uh, the get-go that you have best practices that for the most part are going to lead you down a path of success. And occasionally, you know what, you're going to have some 
bad results, but typically you've mitigated a lot of the risks in those bad results and you've minimized the um, impact that that bad result is having on your project, on your firm, etc. So it's not generally catastrophic in those examples. And so that's where best practices comes into play. And I think I've mentioned it before, if you're, if you're having trouble visualizing what I'm saying, uh, uh, that you know, you're driving a car and you run through a red light and you get to the other side. You made a bad decision, but you had a good result. That doesn't mean you should start running red lights all the time because that's going to catch up to you. Um, on the conversely, if you uh, have a green light and you run through it, occasionally you might have somebody ran, run that red light and hit you. Well, you made a good decision, but you still had a bad result. But 99.999% of the time, that's going to be a good result. Uh, and maybe that's a little bit of learning that if you're coming up onto a light, still look in the peripherals to see if there's anybody coming, even there, though there shouldn't be. That would help to increase your pro probabilities in that case. Um, so yes, uh, there are um, good decisions to be made that sometimes occasionally will give you a bad result. And then there's bad decisions that will occasionally give you a good result. So keep that in mind, but we wanna have processes and systems for the most part that has narrowed that odds in our favor. Um, just like playing poker, you know, a certain hand, uh, like you have a, um, a straight, uh, then that can be a pretty good hand, but many cases you can still lose. So those are uh, examples. All right, and um, actually these are two very good books that I would highly, highly recommend. Both of the, both of the authors um, are uh, world uh, winning poker player, especially Annie Duke. Uh, Maria Konnikova kind of did it as a, a project to write a book, which was very interesting. She writes for The New Yorker, and both of them have PhDs in psychology. So it's kind of really interesting um, how they bring the research side into their practices and how they were able to develop best practices of playing poker and be successful at it. You or I, or at least me playing poker, I'm not gonna be a world champion unless I put a lot of effort into learning and getting better at that and understanding probabilities. And then understanding too, you're not gonna win every time because you're not always, even with a good hand, you're not gonna win. So I'm kind of trying to compare that to decision-making processes that we have to make in construction and understanding uh, how things are going. We had a plan for this project. We took our estimate this was what we looked at. It's a good estimate. Maybe we were awarded the project. We converted that estimate into our budget. Now we have all these different line items that we can monitor and we can see what actually executes and how well it's executing. And we can learn from that if we're not executing at the budget price that we had. Was it a problem with the estimate or the budget item for that particular area? Was it a problem in the execution? Was it a problem with the subcontractor? Was it a problem in the communication? And that gives us a feedback loop to learn and get better and to improve if we have more of that work coming up in the project. So this is where project management tools and techniques really comes into a effect. So uh, we really, when we think about um, that aspect, it should, when we think about progress measurement, um, uh, an effective progress measurement method should do or be the following, all right? So provide a measure of the physical quantities of work being done. And we've been talking about that, you know, in schedule development and that sort of thing. Provide a measure of the current total scope of the work of the project. So it should all add up so that we know that what's involved and how it plays into that. And of course, that's tying to the work breakdown structure that we've looked in the previous lectures. 2B and 2A. Express the work done as a percentage of the total current scope of work. Well, if you're using a, a software uh, tool and you're saying a certain amount of work, depending what you're measuring, like planned work hours is completed and you have a thousand hours of work completed and uh, the 600, uh, sorry, a thousand hours of work planned, that should tie to a certain amount of physical element of the work. And then you're going to be asking yourself, well, now what total physical element of the work have we got done at this time period? And how many hours has that taken? So we have a good idea as a percentage. Uh, really, 
be giving us, uh, you know, not opinion based, but uh, really measurable uh, so that you're not sort of being overly optimistic or overly pessimistic with the interview, with, with the measurements. And that's again, is where um, measuring from a point, a unit of measurement point of view is very, very helpful as we'll see. So being realistic uh, from that perspective of updating and seeing where you are is important. That's where physical measurement helps. And that's where we go back to management by objectives and Peter Drucker, Drucker saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If I really don't know what, what stage we're at on this project, it's hard. And that's again, getting the right level of detail in the work breakdown structure. Um, and so we should, it should be agreed upon and that goes to specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time bound, um, reasonable. All right. So it should be that we're not putting undue pressure on anyone uh, that is uh, making them acquiesce to our demands because likely they won't be able to do it in the end of the day. Uh, be efficient and productive and not be uh, so time consuming or bureaucratic that it, it's difficult to um, to best represent the cost that's involved in doing this. We have to have an efficient system, in other words shouldn't be onerous. It shouldn't be that the system is taking more time than to executing the work. So um, these are all parts that come into um, that part of it. And of course, uh, if we can get actual work hours and costs uh, associated there with the amount of volume of work and some sort of measurable means of uh, reviewing that, then that'll be really helpful for us. Uh, and it really should give uh, value to the client. So what gives value to the client from the perspective of getting the work done and progressing to meet their requirement of having this completed project? You want to get this project done as qu quickly and cost effectively as possible. And then once that's done, then it starts to add value to the client. And of course, We'll be talking about cash flow, schedule of values, billings, front loading, earn value analysis uh, later in this course and what can be billed for. All right, can get very interesting here uh, when we look at that because, well, just think of it this way. Uh, clients don't really like to pay for pre-construction very much. Why is that? They don't see any value of your planning and your setting up a site and mobilizing and this sort of stuff. They only see value when there's a hole be, being dug in the ground and there's footings and foundation walls and that sort of thing. They can see the value in that. The other stuff, they don't see any value in it. So this gets interesting later on when we talk about cash flow and schedule of values, payments, uh, some of the issues in the industry, front loading, etc. So systems thinking, uh, I just want to run through sort of a, a process uh, that you can think about for scheduling. And I'm going to take a very granular view. And there's systems in everything. Every, I, you know, everything that you interact with pretty much has, if it's done well, has a system um, involved in it. We have a justice system, right? We have a process um, for people to seek justice, whether it's in civil or criminal. We have telecommunication systems that are in place that allows us to do this that we're doing right now. Um, we have construction infrastructure systems that allows us to build our buildings, to run our buildings, to run our transportation systems, etc. So you get the idea. So we should have systems in place that allows us to be able to run and manage our projects effectively and to control effectively our costs, our schedules, our quality, all of those elements. So um, part of that is that I will be also showing you um, um, a high level sort of uh, method of updating and recovery, covering a process and the direct method of really sort of just having a process in place and what you're trying to accomplish and how it fits into the whole system. All right, so, um, but first we'll take a little bit of a granular view and, you know, if I just to reiterate sort of the scheduling process, you might have a good uh, handle on this already, but uh, it's important uh, to really think about things, how they fit in as a system. So, you know, you've got an activity, you've got a status date and the status date is the date we, act, we update the activity to. 
And so we update it and we say it's 100% complete and it looks like it was supposed to finish on Tuesday, but now it's finishing on Friday. Um, so when we're updating that, we are actually putting in actual starts and actual finishes. So that's the difference between having a baseline and actual starts and actual finishes. So when we do that, we see this started one day late and it took three days longer to complete. So the questions we want to ask is why did it take one day uh, late to start? And why is it taking three days longer to complete? What's going on, right? There would be cost implications with this too. Like what, what potential cost, if we're self-performing this work, did this take our crews uh, three days longer? Um, well, really it would only take our crews one day, but why were they delayed? Were there any cost implications to this? And for certain, there would be if this is three days longer, because if you've got a management crew on site, they would end up being there three days longer if this plays out to the whole project and is on the critical path. It's gonna delay the project by three days. Um, so we would be looking at that and reviewing that. And maybe we didn't do anything about that and another month has gone by. One, two, three, four. Typical updating process, timeframes are monthly. Uh, you have to go by what the contract says that you provide a, a formal update to the client monthly, uh, but it could be every two weeks and you may be monitoring it in shorter periods than that. For sure, when we talk about short-term scheduling, you do, uh, but on the master schedule, typical is monthly. And so, that you can sort of see what's been going on in the past month. You would want to find out what happened in the last month. You would want to update your activities with actual starts, actual finishes, or any changes that might be going on in the project and input all that information in whatever way possible, uh, depending on your systems and show the impact of actual starts and actual finish dates here. Now, if you have those actual starts and actual finish dates updated, then what you would want to do is check and see, well, all right, great, we updated it, but what's, what is the impact it's having on our project? Like what's happening? Well, we went, what we can see here is we went from three days behind schedule to eight days behind schedule. So in the last month, we've actually increased by five days. So now we're currently eight days behind schedule. Now, if I had input this in a schedule and I was monitoring my um, individual resources, I could actually see the variable cost impacts on this. For this example, in this um, lecture, I'm just gonna look at it from the time perspective. Uh, we'll be looking at it then from the cost perspective as well because they both have implications. But for sure, I'm gonna have, if this ran to the end of the project, I would have my variable costs would be upped by eight days. So if I had a site super on the project and a PM uh, there on the project, uh, that would be eight days of extra costs for them. Not to mention that this is extra costs for the resources involved. So if I only allocated in my budget that this was going to take up to this point, um, a normal uh, a period of time of duration, and we're eight days longer, well, there would be eight days of labor costs that I would be incurring as well. And maybe I'd have other equipment costs that would be variable as well. So if the crane is gonna be there longer, that would be um, an extra eight days of the crane being there. Now, we could also take that one step further. This is the first floor. Maybe it's a 30 story building. So maybe we got another 29 stories. So that would put us um, further behind, right? So these time frames we could see would be adding up. Like if I go back to the first floor, remember we were three days behind, right? Um, and on that, just on that forming and installing uh, the, the floor, right? Um, well, if we add all the other stuff, that's eight days per floor uh, finish variance. That's a lot of time there. That's a lot of time there. So we have to look at the potential impact that can have over the whole project. So that's where we start looking at trends forming that we mentioned in the earlier lectures uh, where a trend forms and then that could be a multiple of that over the project. And then you're really exploding on your cost impacts. Now, trend does not mean it has to happen. We did just to reiterate Stein's law, a trend will continue until it stops. Well, that's our job to try to make this stop 
And that's what cost control is all about. That's what schedule control is all about. So in that case, we want to take a look at this and we want to look at how do I get this time back, right? And so we're going to take a sort of step-by-step -step process of that because we can see where we lost it. Well, now we want to look at how we get the time back. So getting the time back is forward-looking. Updating it is backward-looking. So we're looking at history, right? So getting the time back is forward-looking. That's what we want to do now. We want to do a recovery of the schedule. So we updated the schedule. We know where we're at. We're eight days behind. Very important to understand that in a timely fashion. So here we see we are eight days behind and we're replanning the work, reiterating iterations involved in projects. So we're going to take a step-by-step -step approach. You know what? If I could get the time back on one activity, I'd do it, right? If I could get it back without it costing anything, I would do it. But generally it takes a few things to happen for you to be able to get that time back and like that first example where i had one day we started late two days it took longer uh, to do that one activity uh, or the two activities in the beginning that i mentioned um, well maybe we started one day late we just weren't ready so that's okay in the sense that that probably won't happen again the two days longer duration, just maybe I'll just go back a few slides here just to go through that again, to make sure that we're clear on this. Um, the two, one day that we started late and the two days longer duration it took. Okay, so we were just late starting, right? That's not going to be a problem coming up because we're now mobilized there. We're good. So the, why did it take two days longer? Maybe it was the learning curve, you know, it's something new, first floor. We're over it. We're going to be fine from this point. So maybe Stein's law, that part's not going to be such an issue. But on the other hand, if we got another 30 floors to do with this, and this is just on the forming of the first floor, and that took two days longer, uh, or number, tw number 29 floors, that would end up making us um, 60 days late, 61 days late overall in the project. So we want to make sure if it's because of a lack of resources or methodology problems, that we address those sooner rather than later so that we can get that time that we're not losing it in our future views, our recoveries, right? So we want, we've got to fix the root cause of the problem, understanding the root cause. And we'll look at that later in the course when we talk about the five whys. And we have to look at how do we um, get the eight days that we lost back. So we got two things that we've got to be thinking about when we're reiterating. So those have to be dealt with. Some might be a non-issue, like the one day, like I mentioned. Others might be a lack of resources, uh, not enough on the forming crew. So we've got to have, if it's a subcontractor, we've got to talk to that subcontractor um, to ensure that we can get time back. And then we work with uh, the scheduling software and we try to look at, well, what's the best path to recovering the time? So critical path, it does no good to shorten activities that have float. Uh, we really want to shorten activities that are on the critical path. And so this is where I get into this direct method, if you will. Um, so really, I want to detect opportunities along the critical path that we can save time on. And I want to do it immediately. I don't want to do it later in the project. I want to deal with it as soon as possible. In this case, we're going to look at recovering the time step by step. So here you can see it is the variance goes from eight days to seven days, and that could be done by shortening the duration. Well, the only way you really shorten the duration is if you've if this was a subcontractor and you've discussed with them bringing in more resources because it's taking too long uh, and they've agreed to it and now you've agreed that the duration can be sh uh, shortened then that would have an impact on that so that would help you to shorten that and perhaps you've also had a discussion about sh uh, basically overlapping these two activities so if you feel that these can be overlapped and there's effective resources then that might be another solution to be able to 
um, shorten the time period and bring it down another two days. So you might have shortened the duration and you might have given a negative lag here and that would give you two days. So it's sort of step by step looking for how you can get the time back. And as I said, you're looking for the, the no or low cost solution, but maybe you've determined, well, the only way that we can do this also is by to help get the time back for now is to work a weekend. So you change your calendar so that you make this Saturday and this Sunday a working uh, working days. And now that's going to shorten it a further two days. And you also look at so that's saving you another two days. And then you also look at pulling this back with a negative lag and shortening by one day one of the activities again. So you end up going from eight days to seven days to five days to one day and then you're finally back at zero. So it took maybe four or five different things in order to make that happen. Like I said, if I could just do it on one thing, I would do it, you know, but it just depends on your project. And I'm trying to point out that it can be more complicated than just a quick fix. Uh, but if you have got the buy-in of that subcontractor on this and they're agreeing to do these things, uh, then you're a long way towards the path of being successful. And so we can sort of, if you started thinking about processes and systems of how you do things, then it becomes easier to um, develop a framework for how you approach your cost management and your schedule management processes. So we can sort of put what I just said into a methodology. All right. And I tend to call this the direct method. And it's a six point process that is encompassing a bunch of things. But all these things are being built on what we're learning in this course and maybe what you've learned in other courses regards to project management, planning and scheduling. The first one is, well, we have to have developed a really good plan and schedule and know where our costs are being assigned and work through it. So we've got a baseline structure, a baseline schedule, baseline costs. Uh, and so we know what we're trying to compare to. If we do that, then once we update, we can detect opportunities along the critical path. Because if we're trying to get this project done on time and on budget, well, we definitely should detect opportunities along the critical path. Like I said before, saving time where there's float isn't necessarily going to help us get back on uh, time on our project. Um, so we definitely want to look along that path. We want to look sooner that rather than later. There's no point in saving time at the end of the project. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Well, if you save time along the end of the project, when you get to the end of the project, when new stuff happens, you're going to be stuck. So you definitely want to save time along uh, that route because, you know, as soon as possible, because later on, if you're taking time, like say you, you notice, Oh, in uh, punch list and deficiencies, we've allowed two weeks. That's easy then. We'll take out one week from that. Well, when you get to the end, there'll be so much in deficiencies and punch lists, uh, you won't be able to get it done, right? So you want to get it out sooner rather than later. So that's the immediate savings, the I and direct. The R is look for the no or low cost solution. You're looking to reduce or eliminate costs, extra costs. So anywhere that you can squeeze out savings, that's very important. So whenever you're looking for ways to shorten the schedule, you're also looking for ways to recoup uh, any extra cost overruns that you've had. So for example, if, if the project's running eight days longer and it costs us $10,000 a day to run our project, our infrastructure, our management systems, our financing on this project, if it's costing us $10,000 a day. If we're able to bring it back, eight days, then that's $80,000 in savings right there, just looking at the per diem cost of running your project. So you may have even in some cases uh, where you might see, well, we can get the eight days back, but it's gonna cost us 15,000 in overtime. Well, that's probably a pretty good investment, right? Cause you're getting back 15, you're, you're saving $80,000 and you're spending 15. So that's a savings of 65 from your cost overrun. That's a pretty good start. 
um, experiment. That's the nice thing about uh, having a cost loaded schedule. You can kind of experiment and you can do a sensitivity analysis. You can play with it, right? You could do a save as on whatever you're working and you can just try, knock yourself out trying different scenarios and looking at that and reviewing that. And it gives you a good sort of sense of what's going on. So that's the nice thing if you had a good sort of cost loading to begin with from a budget, from the estimate, and you've got realistic time frames then you can start adjusting, playing, iterating, uh, seeing what might be the best plan. Now, I can always get a schedule to get back on track, pretty much, unless it's like ridiculous or it's too late uh, on the software. But can I do it in real life? Well, that's another story. I've got to, if I'm looking and I see like I just did those four or five things that we did to get the time back, if I'm seeing that that is, um, uh, working on a schedule, that's great. But can I get the people that are supposed to be doing that? If that forming sub says, we're not working weekends, we don't work weekends, my plan is no good. So I've got to make sure I get the commitment of those people that are involved, the subcontractors or any individuals too. Uh, you know, you've got a shipper for a particular supplier that needs to... Um, get something delivered to your site. Well, if that's part of your plan and they're saying it's a no-go, well, your plan's not gonna be very good. So you gotta get the commitment of the people that are involved in this replanning of the work, just like you need the commitment in the original planning of the work for it to actually happen. But if you do get their commitment, now you're getting along that path, right? Now it's becoming to be, it's beginning to become clear. And hopefully you're seeing how this fits in with SMART goals, right? Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-bound, commitment. So that's fitting in there. And if you do that, you know what? If you do that, then the team is going to feel like it's a win. You've got to, things happen, you're getting yourself back on track. Next month, something else is going to happen, you're getting yourself back on track. So then you start to become a little bit more resilient to these interruptions in the flow of work because you're able to reiterate and replan the work and get yourselves back on track and it's not like oh you know you keep getting worse and worse and worse you're keeping it under control you're keeping the variation contained and that's important in construction project management because very very often projects just swing out of control wildly out of control go wildly over budget and wildly over schedule. Um, so that really ties into that. Also, there is a circle of influence and we'll talk about that in another lecture. And if you keep this positive framework of uh, the team and motivation and engagement on your project, the circle of influence that that has amongst the, the team members, the subcontractors, everybody that you're communicating with is such a positive influence it really does help to lead to a project of support growth and moving in the right direction like we talked about the growth mindset um, in uh, the previous lecture this helps to feed in towards that so definitely um, that plays into that so that's what i wanted to cover with the direct method and we'll be looking at now how that connects with uh, in lecture 4b uh, the um, uh, overall macro view of what we're doing on our projects because I do find that people often get stuck in the weeds and they don't see the big picture. So we kind of were looking at this with the weeds, you know, we update this, we do this, oh, we're behind, we're over budget, oh, we're behind, we're and then where we're at. But understanding that and then getting that time back. But how is this, how does that look from a higher viewpoint what is actually going on in our project and so we'll look at that in the next video so that's what i wanted to cover this is tom stevenson signing off for now wishing you a wonderful day and we'll see you in lecture 4b bye for now